Hello everyone, it's Story here, and welcome to another video. This video is going to be holiday edition of Tipsy Tales. And for those who don't know, Tipsy Tales is me getting tipsy and telling tales. I uh, attempted to the best of my abilities after having some drinks to retell well-known tales, and for this video, because it's holiday edition, I'm going to be doing three. One, uh, I'm going to do the Christmas Carol, uh, I'm going to be doing the Polar Express, and the third one is Twas the Night Before Christmas. Two of them were recommended to me on Twitter when I did a tweet asking what they people wanted me to do. So without further ado, let me go get tipsy. <clears throat> let us begin. We're going to start with A Christmas Carol. This was originally published in 1843 and its actual title, I have to actually look it down at this because it's long, A Christmas Carol, period, in pro, period, being a ghost story of Christmas, period. The fuck? Uh, it was written by Charles Dickens. This is actually a novella, but uh, a lot of words happen. So it's in five staves, and uh, this is actually Dickens' like really fancy, pretentious, self-proclaimed label for chapters. I'm not really even sure what a stave means. I should go find that out. So apparently it's just a verse or stanza of a poem, which is weird because it's in, an, in a novella, and there's the word prose in the title said novella, so Dickens, what's the truth? All right, so stay one. Our, our, our scene here, here we go, is Christmas Eve in London. Uh, it has been seven years since the death of, what's his name, Marley, Jacob Marley, I would say James Marley. He was the business partner of Ebenezer Scrooge, who is our main character of this wild ride that we're about to go on. Now, Scrooge Meister, he is a huge anti-Christmas bro, like, hates it. He generally hates, you know, everything that isn't money, and that, that's really it. I could literally end it right here, and that's all you need to know. But he is a giant dickbag, like, whoa. He has all this fucking money, he could retire and go be angry about the world alone in a different place and not be dick to people, but no. He needs to be a dick to people, that, that is his life's purpose at this point. For example. These two dudes come in and they're asking for donations for money that will like help save lives, you know, give food and, and shelter to people. And he basically just like kicks them out of his fucking office. Dick move. And he barely lets his uh, underpaid and overworked clerk, Bob, is that his name? Bob, yes, Bob Cratchit. I like his last name, Cratchit. Uh, he barely lets him have the day off for Christmas. But the only reason that he does is because he wants to keep up with societal standard. He wants to look good, but not actually be good. So, you know, typical patriarchy hypocrisy right here. Bob Cratchit will be important later on. We'll get to him a little bit later. So anyway, Scrooge, he goes home after his work day or whatever. He's laying in bed, ready to go to sleep. And he ends up being visited by the ghost of Marley, who is all chained up and like not doing so hot, really not doing well. And he's warned um, Scrooge not to continue with the bullshit that he's doing. Otherwise, he'll end up in the same position as Marley. Marley's full on check yourself before you wreck yourself. Scrooge is all, what the fuck are you talking about? And uh, Marley's like, oh, P.S. You're gonna be visited by three ghosts, spirits of Christmas. And, uh, you need to do what they say or you're, you know, screwed. Personally, I'd be okay with that, but whatever. It's Charles Dickens' novel. Day two, time for the ghost of Christmas past. So now this ghost, he shows up, scares the shit out of uh, Scrooge and takes him on a journey through flashbacks of his life, which you find out is pretty lonely, I guess. I don't really believe it. But you also find out that Scrooge was a major dick to his fiance, Belle, and she actually ended the uh, engagement because he was more in love with money than her. Is anyone really surprised by that? Because I wasn't. And so at the end of this little journey that this ghost takes Scrooge on, you find out that Belle is actually happily married and has a huge, wonderful family. Good for her. You go, Belle. You shouldn't be victimized because you're chose yourself and happiness. Save three, enter. Ghost of Christmas present. Now he brings Scrooge along to show him all the things that he's missing, basically. People Christmas shopping, well, last minute Christmas shopping. Cooking, they're celebrating the holiday. You see um, Marley's family celebrating, and you see, you know, Scrooge's family celebrating. And then you see the Cratchits, actually. You see the Cratchit family, and this is where Tiny Tim is, is shown. He's so God damn adorable. Love him. Favorite character of the book. He's so cheerful, regardless of any health issues that he has, and I could go into a rant about all of that. Love on Tiny Tim some more, but I'm going to move on. After the journey, Scrooge is back home, and uh, the ghost is like, oh, by the way, Tiny Tim, he's going to die soon. That little cute child that you just saw, 
making everyone happy. He's, he's gonna die soon. It's gonna be your fault. Day four, we finally have the ghost of Christmas. What was it? Christmas yet to come. I'm used to Christmas future or whatever. That would make more sense, but whatever. So Scrooge sees uh, the these scenes about this uh, man who has just passed away who nobody nobody likes. Businessmen will only go to the funeral as long as there's lunch served. Uh, a few local people end up stealing his stuff for money. You know, nobody really cares. And so Scrooge requests to see anyone that feels anything about this, this man who nobody likes. And so the ghost is like, all right, bro, if you want. And he shows him this couple who are very happy that this man is dead now because now they're uh, out of debt or at least momentarily out of debt and they can have the time to figure out their finances and their life. Like hashtag same forever. Imagine if those who are after your money remember that the average person the average human is doing their best that they can. They really are. Imagine what a world that would be. Ugh. The rant that just occurred in my head just tired me physically completely. So then Ghost shows Scrooge uh, the Cratchit family. Show them mourning Tiny Tim's death. I'm not going to discuss the feelings I have about it. Just know that they're there. Now I bet you're all saying to yourselves, Scrooge, this dead person is you. Nobody likes you. Well, I am the same way. And I actually almost threw the book when I first read uh, A Christmas Carol. But anyway, moving forward. So finally, the ghost shows Scrooge the tombstone of this dead, hated man, and it has his name on it. And therefore, Scrooge uh, starts crying like a man called out on a shit and taking his habit of privilege is taken away. It's not familiar. So at the end of this journey, he gets back home and Scrooge yells out that he's gonna change his ways and. Day five. Scrooge wakes up on Christmas Day uh, in the morning and uh, he's a changed man. Full turnaround. He spends the day with his family and actually anonymously sends a turkey to the Cratchit family. The next day uh, when Bob Cratchit returns to work, he gives him a raise. Uh, he also helps out and takes care of Tiny Tim on occasion. Now I have to wonder, does he actually stay like that? Like does he stay good or not? And now I want, I need someone to write something. Make a movie. I don't, I don't care what it is, but I need to know logically. Would he have stayed good? Or would he have gone back to bad? Or would it like have been like a twisted version of good, but actually he's evil? So like I want, I want the sequel or like epilogue. Give me that internet. And that one was requested by my friend Nikki on Twitter. So the next one is obviously The Polar Express. This was originally published in 1985. Yes. I'm glad I got that right. Um, it was written by Chris Van Al's Allsburg, but if you live under a rock, it's a children's book. So you have this boy, and there's no actual name in the book for him, so I'm gonna give him the name Freddy. The Freddy boy is just kind of chilling. He's laying in bed about to fall asleep on Christmas Eve when he hears a train, which he thinks is weird. He peers at his window and sees a train, and he thinks, what the fuck? So he runs downstairs and goes outside to this train. And I have a couple questions. How does nobody hear him run downstairs and leave the house? Also, why aren't his parents like in the living room like grabbing presents? It's Christmas Eve. I have never met a parent who actually has everything done by Christmas Eve. Why aren't they there wrapping presents? And and if they're not in the living room afraid to get caught, why aren't they like awake wrapping presents? They would know and hear his their only son running down the stairs and outside the house. I have a lot of questions about this and, and someone needs to address them. But anyway, Freddy Boy, he meets the conductor of this train who tells him that this is a train going to the North Pole. The Polar Express, Freddy gets on the train with a stranger onto a train of candy and chocolate with other children that are in their pajamas. I'm just saying a little weird. So eventually they get to the North Pole and they see hella elves there and they're working and they're waiting to watch Santa go off into the night and deliver all of the presents. Santa, he happens to pick Freddy out of all the kids to open the first present of Christmas. White male privilege, am I right? Now, of all the things that Freddy boy can ask for, he asks for a bell from the, one of the reindeers, like their harnesses or whatever. Really weird. I'm not really sure why he picks that, but he does. So Santa flies off, goes about his business, and all the kids get back on the train. And uh, on the way home, 
Freddy realizes that the bell has fallen through a hole that was in his pocket of his rope. Which leads me to ask, were his parents not awake and not wrapping presents late because they're poor? And then I thought, <laughs> well, no, because it's the 80s and uh, white families, you know, they're pretty well off. So, anywho, uh, Freddy gets home. He sneaks back into his house quietly. Nobody knows he's gone for some strange reason. He falls asleep. So I guess he really wasn't too worried about that bell. So he wakes up on Christmas and him and his family are opening presents and he finds a small box for his tree. And within this box is the bell that he was missing. Him and his sister are the only ones that can hear the bell when it rings. His parents can't and they say that it is broken. And so now I'm going to read a little excerpt that the Wikipedia page said was pretty important. At one time, most of my friends could hear the bell, but as years passed, it fell silent for all of them. Even Sarah, that's his sister, found one Christmas that she could no longer hear its sweet sound. Though I've grown old, the bell still rings for me as it does for all who truly believe. And, um, yeah, that's the plot of White Privilege Express. I mean, Polar Express. So I'm gonna end uh, this video on a, on a fun note. We're gonna move on to the night before Christmas. And this one was requested uh, by my friend Mac because she wanted to see me try and rhyme while I'm tipsy. Well, guess what, Mac? I'm gonna do fine. So this actual title is A Visit from St. Nicholas. And there's actually controversy about this. It was originally published in 1823. Um, and then in 1837, a man named Clement Clark Moore claimed ownership of the uh, poem. However, uh, there is a conspiracy, a controversy over the thought that Henry Livingston Jr. actually wrote it. And there's some stuff on the Wikipedia page if you really want to date more into that. So what I'm going to do is instead of doing a synopsis, since it is a poem, and I, and you know what, I don't... I'm not here to analyze poetry, I'm just gonna read it. Twas the night before Christmas, also known as the night before Christmas, or a visit from St. Nicholas. Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below, when what to my wondering eye should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the house, top the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew my hand and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed in all fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a panther just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of belly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod at the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of a thistle. But I heard him explain, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night.
Yeah, I'm glad that shit's over. Okay. There you have it. Polar Express Christmas Carol and Twas the Night Before Christmas. Also known by like three other names. And you know what? Tipsy Tales Hall Edition. Done. My name is Story. Please hit that subscribe button. I put up videos every weekend. And if you like Tipsy Tales, if you like what I'm doing here, hit me up. Let me know. Leave a comment. Leave a like. This was a, a more successful Tipsy Tales than what I thought it would be. And it was actually a lot of fun to do. And um, Brooklyn, this one's a shout out to you. You know who you are. I'm not going to do a movie I hate. And for the record, the internet, that was the National Lampoon's Family Christmas Vacation movie. I don't like that movie. I also don't like any of those movies. So I'm not going to do that because it's my channel and I can do what I want. Uh, I will see you next time, internet. Thank you.